Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we are joined with Dr. Bob Thiel and his remarkable book we were discussing last week, Barack Obama Prophecy and the Destruction of the United States, subtitle is Barack Obama Fulfilling Biblical, Islamic, Catholic, Kenyan, and Other American-Related Prophecies, in question mark, and what about Mitt Romney, question mark. Uh, Welcome back, Dr. Bob. (laughs) Well, today I walked out at the end of the first hour, (laughs) the TV was on, because I was watching the news, and it showed the assemblage of 25 nations doing a mind-sweeping operation, a major operation, while a jet streamed off the front of an aircraft carrier in the Gulf at the Strait of Hormuz. What could be more timely than to have a 12-day exercise in the Gulf, the Persian Gulf at the Strait of Hormuz with this book that you've just published? No wonder it's a shot to the top of the bestseller list at Amazon and uh, Amazon and Amazon Kindle. It's very timely. Well, that was that was the intent. <laughs> we wanted so, it to come out when people would be interested, and of course, so many things going on in the United States and in the Middle East and even in Europe. Uh, actually, since the book has come out already, uh, right. it's made made a lot of people have you know, interest in the subject more than maybe right. they would otherwise. Right. So, um, tell us about uh, some of the other major factors. Last week we went over a few of them. There are a number of uh, prophecies. From, from the thing is that I, that I like about your book, it doesn't just cover you know Christian prophecy. It covers Islamic prophecies, Catholic, Kenyan, and other American related prophecies. It also uh, shows that Obama is fulfilling a role which is literally the, uh, the transformation of the United States. And as I mentioned in the first hour, there's a linkage between QE3 and the printing of money because 87% of the world currency is printed dollars and, and electronic dollars is the U.S. Now with the infinite QE3, it'll soon be over 90%, 95%. And, of course, with the collapse of the world currency, they're going to roll us over to a biometric world currency, otherwise known as the mark of the beast where only divots in their system of supercomputers is considered real money and anything else is considered a crime. Uh, we have a war pending in the Middle East, which means it's going to proceed almost certainly some form of peace treaty after some level of destruction. Uh, it means that we're heading very rapidly toward the time of Jacob's trouble, and Obama has a major role in that. So let's go over some of the points that you have in your book. Okay, well, yeah, you've gone through <laughs> quite a few right, quite a few different things right there. Yeah, right now, uh, related to the peace deal, uh, you know, we the Bible talks about a peace deal. At least most pe- most uh, people who look in uh, the Book of Daniel believe a peace deal is likely to to be to happen. And normally, we don't see peace deals uh, anywhere, but specifically in the Middle East, without a war first. So the U.S. has been doing things. Uh, Israel's doing things. Others are doing things. The Brits are doing things. Uh, the Canadians actually pulled out their. Uh, their, there, their there. embassy personnel yeah. a week or two back out of out of Iran. So which we're means seeing, we're ready to bomb them. When you, when you stop negotiating, you pull back your embassy staff and you eject all the Iranians. It means we're now uh, in a pre-war setting. Yeah, that's 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 the way I took it. Uh, of course, they don't say it that way, but uh, uh, the yeah, Canadians that's, that's are vassals to the U- U.S. administration, whichever Democrat or Republican. And if the Mr. Bear, the foreign minister, for, defense minister for Canada, did this, it's because he's been advised we're getting ready to do an air attack on Iran. And of course, it also means Syria, because Syria is a backdoor to Iran. So, very dangerous and stupid move. Yeah, they're both. Yeah, both uh, Syria and, and Iran are really uh, attached to each other. And what's been interesting with the whole Iranian situation is, from a Western perspective, we see Iran, and it's like. Come on, Iran. You, how many times are you not going to let the uh, the nuclear inspectors inspect? You know, and so a, couple, a month or two back, it looked like okay, they're going to let them in again, and supposedly that's going to be fine. Of course, people in Israel have said, "Nah, this is all just delaying tactics. They just want you people to delay. They're not serious." And the world community is like, "Oh, Israel, you're wrong. There's no, they're they're willing to talk to us." So what do we do? What, 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 what happens? What happens is, of course, the U.N. wants to do it again, and uh, Iran is like, no, we don't really think you should. But we thought this is what you agreed to. Well, that isn't exactly what we thought we agreed to. <clears throat> so right. uh, we, we're seeing that. And as a Western perspective, you're like, you know, why would Iran be so belligerent? I mean, why, you know, don't they know that uh, you know, Israel may attack them, the United States may bomb them? And the reason having weapons, uh, having weapons uh, prevents you from being attacked. Even the threat that you might have weapons. This is the very reason why Saddam Hussein wasn't completely taken over in the first Gulf War, is because they feared he'd actually use the weapons which he's holding back. 
When he oh. removed the weapons and they thought they were gone, they removed to Syria. Then we had Gulf Two. Gulf Two couldn't happen until after those nasty weapons were out of Iraq. Well, a couple, three things on that. First, Syria uh, is believed to have test launched the firing systems at least for uh, chemical weapons uh, last month. This is that was in the paper about two days ago. But as far as getting back to Iran and and my book, my book warns that you know according to. Uh, Iranian interpretations of prophecy, they need to uh, cause chaos to cause a leader called the Imam Mahdi to rise up. Now, this is an Islamic leader, and while I don't think Iran's going to get quite the leader that they want, there is a, a biblical figure called the King of the South who might uh, tie into this. Right. In other words, it may be the caliph or caliphate that there are the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, the comments by Mr. Mohammed Morsi are kind of saying, hey, if you didn't have such good relations with Syria, we could have better relations with you. This is the latest comment by Mohammed Morsi, the new elected Muslim Brotherhood leader of Egypt. That's very telling, isn't it? Yes, it is. But to, to bring us back to Barack Obama, you know, which you'd asked me before, and I've mentioned this in the past on your show, there's a uh, a prophecy from the 15th century, it's a Shiite prophecy, that's the type of uh, Muslims most of the uh, Iranians are. And it tells of a time when a, quote, tall black man will assume the reins of the government in the West. Now first let's just stop there for just a moment. Since this prophecy came out, there's never before been a tall black man who assumed the reins of the government in the West. Western nations have never had, at least significant ones, have never had a black leader. So that's interesting. And then it says he's going to be commanding, quote, the strongest armies, uh, the strongest army on earth. Well, the strongest army on earth, as far as I can tell, and what you've said to me uh, privately as well as on the air, is, is that of the United States. Yeah, America's Navy, for example, just looking at the throw weight, our Navy, in terms of its actual weight, just the weight of our ships, is more than the 17 largest following nations. That means... Russia, China, Britain, France, Spain. In other words, you take the top 17 nations after us, and they still don't equal our weight of our Navy. That's just one, one measure. Yeah, the U.S. is definitely the, uh, the, you know, the strongest military on the planet. But so anyway, so this is centuries-old Shiite prophecy that says that this leader, this Iranian-desired leader, the Imam Mahdi, is supposed to rise up when there's this tall black man uh, who has uh, runs the... The government in the earth has got the biggest, the government in the West has got the strongest army. Well, whether or not anybody believes anything about this prophecy in the United States, if enough Iranians do, and I suspect that some do, if enough Iranians do, they may decide that they need to cause the Imam Mahdi to rise up during the time of President Obama. And what's also related to this, and I do go to this into the, into my, uh, in, in the book, there's another Iranian prophet, or Shiite Muslim prophecy, uh, or actually the Sunnis as well, that the belief is that the Imam Mahdi will rise up in an even-numbered year. And you say, well, this year is uh, 2012, so therefore this is an even-numbered year, and that's he's supposed to rise up. Well, kind of. Basically, it's based on the, uh, the Muslim year. And the Muslim year starts in November, by the way, in case your listeners were unaware of that. The current year is 1433, and it ends on November 14, 2012. And the new year starts November 15, 2012. So that will be the year 1434. So that will be an even-numbered year. Well, tying all this to Barack Obama prophecy and all the rest, you've got the president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who basically believes that his job is to cause Imam Mahdi to rise up before he leaves office. And he's supposed to leave office at the end of the... Uh, Muslim year 1434, and so therefore, if his predictions are right, he's supposed to want to cause a war within the next 14 months. Yeah, on the other side of the break, we talked about uh, a couple of another prophecy we talked about him and perhaps the destruction of the United States. And we are coming back with. Remarkable, Dr. Bob Thiel in his book, of course, Barack Obama Prophecy and the Destruction of the United States. Uh, you've done what we call a very analytical look at this. As I tell people, keep your skepticals on, but when you look at all these prophecies lining up, you cover everything from the Catholic to the Nostradamus prophecies to the, the Christian ones, all kinds of them all over the world. And they all say 
things that are all kind of making sense of what's going on with our current history. It also, as I said before, unless something really happens to screw things up, I see a re-election of Obama. Uh, I see the campaign of Mitt Romney being run very poorly. Uh, he doesn't demonstrate any fire, even though he makes statements he supports the middle class. One of the biggest disasters is our health care, and Obama's brought in Obamacare. Even if it's screwed up, he's tried to do something. Uh, and it's also got some very evil parts of it, including the abortion and other issues. The fact is the average American is terrified about health care problems. Two-thirds to three-quarters of the people who go bankrupt will go bankrupt because they have a health problem in their family. Then we have the management of the economy. People are worried they're going to be thrown under the bus uh, under an austerity fascism regime, under um, Romney, etc. And then we have the sneakiness with Israel. He doesn't want to make an overt statement supporting Israel because if they do a preemptive attack and it goes south, he could lose re-election. So Obama's playing a politic of this very, very much more clever than uh, Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is a novice from what I can see in terms of his PR campaign, etc. He really is running his campaign almost to lose. And that means if if Obama is back in, let's, let's feed into all of these analysis of all these prophecies because you've got lots to say today. Well, one of you know, the, the, a couple of them. A lot of people are surprised if I talk about uh, uh, biblical and non-biblical prophecies to talk about the destruction of the United States. But uh, first of all, uh, as, as many of your listeners I think are aware, uh, Barack Obama's father was a was Kenyan, right. and uh, from a tribe called the Low Kenyans. And there was actually a Low Kenyan prophecy that says that uh, a leader from their their own people, a son of a low Kenyan, basically, will lead to or cause the destruction of the United States. And that's kind of interesting since, you know, we've got a low Kenyan son who is the president of the United States. But on the biblical perspective, and I, I was watching a, a, another prophetic commentator on television, I think, since I saw you last, and he, he made some comment about prophecy in the United States, but for some reason he missed the one that you and I talked about last time, which I think is a very significant one, and that is that in Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 39, it talks about the, the king of the north, uh, and that he's going to go against the strongest fortresses and divide the land for gain. Now, if you read other passages in that prophecy, it says it's for the appointed time, the time of the end, and all that kind of stuff. And if we are in the end times, and I happen to believe that we are, uh, getting back to the strongest armies on earth, well, I would think that the nation with the strongest fortresses on earth would have to be the United States. And while Americans don't think this is possible, uh, I think there's enough uh, both going on morally in the United States, uh, many things going around the world that most people don't have a clue about that are actually setting up the U.S. for destruction. And it's, it's unfortunate that uh, more and more people don't know about the prophecies. They don't know about what's going to happen. You mentioned uh, earlier also a little bit about QE3 uh, for, your, for your listeners. QE stands for uh, quantitative easing. Now, if everybody could go and counterfeit money in their backyard, everybody would be a millionaire, a billionaire, whatever, really quick. But most people would figure out, look, if everybody can just print up money, nobody would go to work. And we wouldn't have anything. Yeah. Just, just printing up money doesn't actually make anything. And so what the quantitative easing program is, since it's a term that normal people wouldn't really use, is basically a way the government invents money. They just decide we're going to print money, and the asset that they purchase with this money is a piece of paper from the U.S. government says that we will pay you back. <laughs> a treasury bill is, is, is basically how it's backed. The case money, it's some funny money. Created a, yeah, funny money created out of thin air. What it's doing is it's laying the groundwork for the mark of the beast. If you go from 87% of the world currency, electronic or otherwise, to say 95 or 98% in the next two or three years, and you cause massive worldwide hyperinflation, uh, you've got a situation now where you're going to have to replace it with a new world virtual currency that's electronic and biometric. And that tells me that, that if we get a second term of Obama, he's laying the groundwork for literally the mark of the beast. And I'm going to say this is an absolute, not even open for discussion. The mark of the beast will come from the United States of America, period. Not from Europe, not from Russia. It will come from the United States. 
Well, you and I have a difference of opinion on that, as you know, because I believe it's, it's going to be European. But I do believe no, it won't be European. The European will just be a, a vassal of it. See, Europe, the European Central Bank went a week before the uh, they did the QE three. Because where do you think they're going to get all that money? They don't have enough. They cannot print enough euro currency because it's a small currency and it'll inflate very quickly. If they print twenty trillion dollars in America, do you know how much it inflates the total amount of money that's already printed? It has almost no effect. It's insignificant. They can't print enough euros. The euro is tied to it. The European is part of it. And yes, they're going to have branches of the system. But the supercomputers that manage the world currency system, even though the central no- there are going to be nodes in London and Belgium and elsewhere, the central node is America. I visited. I was actually one of their Q level clearance doctors. This isn't even open to discussion. I took care of employees that were working on the Virtual World Project in the mid 90s, almost like 16 years ago, 17 years ago. So, no, it's America. It, it, this is not even something that you, you, you should, people should realize. Just look at America's power. If you knew the occult power of all the fancy weapon systems that the other nations know or don't know we have, America literally, as it says in the Bible, can rain fire down from heaven. We have the plasma weapons of Nikola Tesla. We can create a hundred million kiloton nuclear, or megaton nuclear explosion over a city, a nuclear-like explosion, with a plasma weapon to create superheated air to a hundred million degrees over any city within minutes without firing a missile anywhere we can create nuclear we can create uh, geotectonic ex- explosions and cause tectonic plates to break anywhere on the planet we have the tectonic weapon we literally have weapons that can strip the ozone layer over a specific area of the world and literally fry them from space just by opening up the rent in the uh, ozone layer we have all these weapons so literally man the man in the white house is the king of earth right now and that's the thing that people don't understand. And they're moving. People think we're heading toward a depression. No, we're heading toward the mark of the beast. And yes, so Europe is going to be part of the system. And so will China and Russia. In fact, there's a lot of jockeying as to how they're going to have exchangeable currencies because the Chinese are just printing money that's not exchangeable. Neither is a ruble. The only exchangeable currency for the whole world is the dollar. And it's not going to be replaced. It's going to be transformed into the mark. Well, as you know, I I think that the U.S. may find it's going to inflate its dollar too much, and the world. Well, what, how, what can you? It doesn't matter though, because if you're making ninety, if you have QE three in in a year, another trillion dollars, another two or three years could be ten trillion. If you have ninety five percent of the world currency uh, are now in U.S. dollars, the Chinese can't sell anything to us unless they have an exchangeable currency with us or take our dollars. Well, but the Chinese are trying to take steps right now to, to trade directly with the Russians, to trade directly Doesn't, with... Uh, that's, that's, um, that's, only a, that's a stopgap. That won't do anything. The Russians uh, don't have a real economy except the oil economy, and they only have it if they sell the oil to other nations that have a real economy. So uh, they're stuck. America and the banksters in, in London have total control of the world financial system, and it's going to get a lot worse before it becomes the mark. Welcome back, and uh, yeah, the interesting discussion that we were talking about off uh, air about an announcement today about Barack Obama. Tell us about that, and this can kind of fit in the prophetically too. Um, well, well, what happened was at Barack Obama when he was speaking at Loyola University on the October nineteenth, nineteen ninety eight, made some comments uh, suggesting he wants to redistribute redistribute wealth. And okay, fine, I heard about that this morning, and. Uh, USA Today online, I see an article here from David Jackson, and the, the headline is White House, Obama is not a redistributionist. And what's interesting, and let me read to your listeners the same thing I read to you uh, off air. It said, quote, the White House said today that the release of 14-year-old tape of Barack Obama discussing redistribution reflects desperation from su- supporters of Mitt Romney. Quote, all of us who follow politics and policy have seen circumstances like this where a campaign is having a very bad day or week, said White House spokesman Jay Carney. Quote, and in circumstances like that, there are efforts made and sometimes desperate efforts made to change the subject, end quote. Now, what I found astounding about this is two things. One, the White House did not say Barack Obama was not a redistributionist. Yeah. That was David Jackson from the uh, 
USA Today who wrote that. I mean, maybe maybe there's more to this part of the story, but I mean, I'm reading what what Jackson just posted online. They just changed the subject, is what they, Jay Carney did. They didn't yeah. want to respond by by making a just response because it could be quoted, and then they could clarify it in some later interview to say, Mr. Obama, do you not believe in redistribution? Of course he does. He, he wants to believe the same thing that's been tried already in the Northeast United States where they had what's called fairness and wages, where they would tell an industry, you can't pay $12 an hour, you got to pay 22 And if you do that, when you have a close-up industry where you have fixed prices and fixed expenses, you can force a lot of businesses right out of business. Unless you're going to top up on the other side and say, okay, you incur a loss business because you're doing this fairness and wages, we'll top you up. Where are they going to get the money? They're going to print it because they they don't get it from taxes. They have to print it, which is an inflatocracy. And we have this from the United States. In fact, in your last chapter, you mentioned that Obama is basically bankrupting the U.S., double the debt, by the way, hurting its military, trying to do a 90% reduction to build down of our nuclear forces, causing civil unrest by race and class warfare, risking its food supply by not taking off this crazy uh, ethanol gas haul thing, and also closing down the access to gas fields, etc. And I, I don't believe in, in allowing hydrofracking in areas that are dangerous and can affect water supply, but offshore Alaskan oil and uh, licenses for oil exploration that's in safe areas off the Gulf of Mexico they should allow. Well, well, since this is a, the Nutra Medical Report, the other thing that I mentioned in the book, and uh, we've chatted about this in the past as well, is he's been an advocate of uh, uh, GMOs, genetically modified organisms in food supply. And I think that's dangerous for the, for the, for the not only well, the health of the country, but the food supply itself. Well, you know, main monocrops are GMO number one. You don't get a proper organogenesis of the child or adult. You actually end up eventually with sterility. If you take rats and you expose them, they're smaller. They have abnormal testicles and ovaries. They end up with abnormal brain development, no mental development, microcephaly, enlarged dementia, increased cancer rates, sterility, and increased maldigestion and premature death. Uh, duh, GMO food isn't just a a for like food, it actually has new biological molecules and organic acids that are toxic to the biology of humans because they're totally foreign. These are not normal foods, they're like foods from a different dimension or a different universe, a different planet. It's not coming from the planet Earth, this is from the planet GMO. Well, what people don't realize is a lot of these GMO crops are specifically engineered to survive certain pesticides. That's why they change them. So right. you've got to think about this. If there, yeah. there are crops that have, I'm going to call it for lack of argument, a Roundup gene. Now, Roundup is this uh, yeah. pesticide that uh, Monsanto produces. And basically, Monsanto, but, excuse me, Roundup kills just about everything that grows. And so would you want to actually eat a plant that Roundup doesn't kill? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, something's been, all, the plant has been altered. Dramatically, because a natural plant couldn't survive this, this chemical onslaught. Well, they gave uh, mon corn to uh, gerbils, and they grew. They, they had purple scrota and started growing hair on the inside of their mouth and had decrease in brain size, a mental uh, enlargement, uh, premature blindness, and death. I mean, it does all kinds of gene switching because these organic acids and genes are unstable and they get inside the person. They also can convert particular bowel bacteria that actually become what we call bioengines. They start developing all kinds of molecules totally unintended by even the GMO people because these genes are not nailed, nailed down. They're actually gene cassettes that are shot in with a gold uh, biogun into the uh, organism to actually create this unstable gene complex to cause unrestrained gene expression. And they can cause unbelievable things to happen that, you know, right out of Dr. Moreau's lab. Well, um, and then there's milder but ne- but also negative things that happen. Like, for example, with uh, the GMO corn stuff, because of that, uh, milkweed doesn't grow as much as it did. And you say, right. so what? Well, as it turns out, monarch butterflies need the milkweed for part of their reproduction and life cycles. So now uh, up where I live, which is near Pismo Beach here, uh, we actually have... Uh, Monarch butterflies come here, and it's a big tourist draw from November to about February. And there's and there are less of them. And one of the reasons it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons there are less of them is because of GMO crops. And the people who did the GMOs, they never tested to see could this affect the other part of the ecology and the environment. They just said, well, you know, if we give it to this rat, it doesn't cause this type of cancer. Therefore, it must be safe. And, you know, I don't know why humans think they know more about God than making food to make 
Yeah. Yeah. But that's what they're that's what they're trying to do, and that's what they've yeah. been doing. Well, we have a leadership here that's uh, totally uh, either evil or ignorant. Uh, you have some interesting things in chapter four. You talk about Barack Obama's name, and of course, we've talked about this in the show with other guests. That Barack Obama basically means lightning fallen from heaven, and if anybody knows their Bible, that sounds awfully familiar with one of the subtitles for this for Satan or his minions. His his name is uh, interesting, and when I was mentioning the uh, the Shiite prophecy before about the tall black man who uh, rises up uh, in Persian. Supposedly, Obama, uh, as you know, three separate words means he is with us. And the old Shiite prophecy for the 1500s says that uh, that this tall black man, when he rises up, it'll be a sign that he is with us. And the fact that his last name, uh, at least in Farsi Persian, means he is with us, I thought it was also an interesting coincidence. And again, even really? if it's someone made up this prophecy, even if it was somebody who invented it and pretended it was centuries old. As long as enough Shiite Muslims believe it, or even non-Shiite Sunni Muslims believe that their leader is supposed to rise up when there's a tall black man in, uh, in charge of the strongest armies on the planet, this this can cause, as, as is told, the term a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we've got a situation now where his, his name kind of ties into it, his, uh, his appearance tends to tie into it, and we're seeing a lot of things going on in the Middle East, and I think part of this is why Iran has been as stubborn if you, from a Western perspective uh, as they have been on this whole uh, nuclear inspection. Because exactly, I think yeah. they want to make enough chaos to have their great to bring forth the Mahdi. Up. And I yeah. think they're looking at the signs and say, oh, these are just proof that they're right. Exactly, yeah. You have some interesting Catholic prophecies here, and we know that according to the, uh, the Maliki prophecies that it's almost certain that there's one more pope Petros and Romanus, we've had experts talking about that. It appears also that if Obama gets reelected, which is more than likely because of the 7 to 8 lead right now, uh, point in the lead, and we're only six weeks away, is that he will be around when the final pope shows because uh, Pope Benedict is pretty old. He right. Was born, Matter of fact, yeah. by, by the yeah. time, if, presuming Barack Obama is reelected uh, and his term ends, the pope will only be a few months shy of age 90. And yeah. The pope already has occasionally dropped hints that perhaps Pope should be able to retire, by the way, uh, and that uh, he's starting to feel his age. Right. And not well, that many I, people live to be 90, so uh, there's a, there is a, a, a real well, possibility I, that the final Pope will, uh, or at least the, the one who fulfills that, that may fulfill that Maliki prophecy. Well, or he can be taking a little medical problem like a stroke or something, something else where he can't function. Uh, I think we're looking at uh, a gentleman that I consider the best candidate I've ever seen for I call the false prophet. I know a lot of people don't think of him as a religious leader, but in a way he is. He's a secular religious leader for a new dialogue of false peace that uh, fits in perfectly with the idea that the final pope will be present here probably during his second term and that uh, there will be a dialogue with the leaders of the East that will bring forth the final system. Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report. Um, as I mentioned on the break, uh, Syria has the largest storehouse of VX nerve gas and RDX of any other nation besides America. <laughs> that means that uh, an attack on Syria is very stupid. Well, the, so, the, uh, the Syria, Syria, I think, wants the world to know that in case it does get attacked, it's going to hit back very, very hard. Um, yeah, <clears throat> the idea of just going in there and bombing it is asinine. Well, except that if they do something that's very bold or uh, uh, in violation of most international uh, agreements, such as the use of uh, chemical weapons, you know, there's a prophecy in the uh, book of uh, Isaiah uh, 17, one talking about Damascus will cease being a, a city, you know, be just become a ruinous heap. And people can debate when that may happen, but let me say when it didn't happen. It hasn't happened since that prophecy was written. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, in fact, we talked with Tim Alexander, whose brother has been there, and he's been there to Damascus it's in the bowl. So one big nuke in that bowl will just wipe out everything. And we know that someday it's going to happen. Right, we know it's going to happen. And, uh, you know, 
I'm not saying it's going to happen this year, uh, but it certainly has, there's the possibility does exist. Uh, again, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the segment earlier, that was that uh, you know Syrians test launched or test fired uh, the, uh, last month the ability to determine that they could actually send shells out with chemical weapons. So they just but, retested this last just a few weeks ago. It was just in the news this week. Yeah, I think that's very stupid on the part of the Syrians to, to doing this uh, saber rattling. It's good, it's just like with the Israelis, keep your nuclear weapons shined up and underground, because if they start using them, things are going to get very, very insane. And by the way, Israel doesn't just have Syrian countries and 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 Iran targeted. If if Russia is directly backing, is directly backing uh, the attack against Israel, Moscow is literally on the same second and minute on the same latitude as the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah. It's 2,000 miles north, which means a missile will, could take out Moscow from Israel. Well, at, at this instant, uh, so far, uh, my general view about Russia in this whole situation has been that Russia will blink. Uh, it, uh, I think so, so far, too, because... It blinked occasionally, and it, it likes Syria, but I don't think it likes it that much. It'll blink to the extent that at least it'll blink temporarily because the peace treaty has to be yeah. brought in. And partitioning of the state of Israel is one of the prophetic things, as I mentioned before. You have to partition the state, start the Temple Mount sacrifice with the Jews, which by the way, they only need a tabernacle of Moses, which the people at the Tabernacle Foundation told me they already have. They have right. the Kohanim, the Kalal, yeah. they got everything. They literally have a call tomorrow if there was a Feast of Tabernacles, could have a sacrifice there with a the red heifer, which is genetically engineered, growing in Switzerland and in Israel. They could have the red heifer there and do the blood sacrifice on the Temple Mount on the right date after erecting a tabernacle overnight, literally right, overnight. They have, right. They have the ability. They, it's, they have a, uh, they call it a portable altar, but even though it's made out of stone, it's uh, unhewn stone. They've right. had this done for a couple of years now. They have the Levitical priests in training. They have their version of the Sanhedrin. They have all these kinds of things. So I actually contacted uh, the Sanhedrin over there. To, to verify all this a few years back, uh-huh. and as you correctly said, they don't uh, they don't feel they need to have a, a temple to do it. They'd like to have a temple, and they might. Oh, get eventually, one. eventually they could have one, but the blood sacrifice will start. Now, by the way, you imagine if you're Muslim and you already believe Muhammad uh, replaced the need for the Jews and even the Christians and said they got it all wrong, and now you got these Jews doing blood sacrifice. It was said that at the time uh, of Jesus that the population would swell up, up to 1.7 million people in the surrounding area, and the stench of blood from the sacrificing animals was run, with the blood running down the center of the streets of Jerusalem was mind-boggling. So people need to kind of get their mind wrapped around this of just how long the Muslims will put up with a blood sacrifice and the Feast of Tabernacles and how long things will stay stable before they, they rip apart. Well, the, the Feast of Tabernacles actually goes on every year and that would be this year to in October, but, right. but they don't have the, sacri- the, the blood sacrifice. At, at Passover time, they don't. Uh, yeah, they're not going to do that. No, but, but what I'm saying is the blood, that the that the tabernacle sacrifice would set the the stage for it, set the stage for the uh, things that are happening. In fact, uh, if you actually know that the first day of the tribulation starts on the Feast of Tabernacles, it's exactly one halfway through the seven year period of 360 day years uh, at the Feast of Passover. Isn't that interesting? And yeah, there, in fact, there's, there's the, different views. Some believe that the Great Tribulation will start. Uh, by the fall Jewish holy days, others believe that uh, it will start at the, around the spring holy days, and there's there's arguments there's arguments for both. Yeah, if you actually read my book Clay and Iron, which will be bringing out the first uh, of the trilogy uh, upgrades and uprights, it actually explains that the timeline is Feast of Tabernacles start of the last seven years. That the uh, stop the sacrifice is stopped 130 days, which is exactly 30 days before Passover. There's five months of death and destruction from that date, which is the five days where death will flee from them. And exactly yeah, the Feast of the Long Blowing, which is called the Feast of Trumpets, which is exactly 2,520 days after the Feast of Tabernacles. Is that was the Monday feast of, this week, by the way. Go ahead. Yeah, and that, that day, by the way, will be the end of the seven years. And if you take the 17th day of Hezvan, which is the time when people have to be kind of been sequestered away from destruction, it's exactly the same day as the olive branch, was received back by the dove by Noah in his ark at the end of the destruction by water, and this is the destruction by fire. So the 17th day of Hezvan says, you know, uh, blessed are those that live to this particular day, the 17th of Hezvan. So I've shown that in specifically in, in uh, clay and iron. So what I am telling people in advance is that there's three things to watch for. Partitioning of the state, 
blood sacrifice in the tabernacle that's portable, and uh, a peace treaty that guarantees at least a seven or a seven year period of of, of of change of peace, a period of peace that's going to be broken in the middle with the blood sacrifice cut off 30 days before Passover. Yeah, we're, we're going to see a seven year deal. It probably will be in the fall of the year uh, and in the middle of it, uh, three and a half year time frame basically. Which will be uh, Passover, which it fits perfectly with with Passover being the time when uh, when Jesus was sacrificed. It fits in with the Passover date. So the, these Jewish dates, these Hebrew dates, which precede, you know, they're both Jewish and Hebrew, are prophetic, and they're very important. That's why Messianic Christians, and I'm one of them, understand some things that Christians who don't want to study these, who don't understand them, will not understand why these things are timed, because there's a... In a sense, Ephraim includes the Christians. Ephraim includes the lost tribes that became apostate and were cast off by the Assyrians. And God's going to deal with these two houses of Israel again in the end times. That's why it's not just the time of Jacob's trouble, it's the time of the trouble of Ephraim as well. Well, Ephraim is actually one of the sons of uh, Jacob. Uh, You know, Jacob uh, adopted Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And said, "You'll be our sons, like uh, Judah or Reuben was my son." Right. And so that that ties into the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, let's go through some of the other final steps here. This is pretty amazing. So, you, you, what about Nostradamus? What uh, What does he say about all of this? Well, Nostradamus actually, uh, it, it, his writings are a little different. You know, his yeah, writings, their quatrains are confusing, basically. To, well, there's a couple of views on why he wrote them that way. One is so he wouldn't get killed. Yeah, good, good um, reason. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for for your listeners, Nostradamus was a, was was a Catholic uh, seer. Uh, some some Catholics uh, distance themselves from him, and others say, well, no, he was he was a Catholic, and he he had visions and whatever, and and he would he would write them down. But he basically he he talked about. Uh, that uh, America is going to reign and hold power in the sky and land, and shall never perish under Asian forces until seven pontificates have passed. Now, this is uh, from a, a Catholic book. I'm, I, I cite this in my book, but this is actually from a Catholic writer. Right. And he basically said that uh, the following. He says, I think it's from the reign of Pius XII that the seven pontificates must be counted. And this brings us to the last pope, according to St. Malachi's list, when the world ends. And that's from Yves uh, Dupont, who wrote a, a book on Catholic prophecy. So that was his analysis of that particular uh, Malachi. Sure. Excuse me, that, so where were that, that places in terms prophecy. of the... Where were that places with their current Pope, pope Benedict? Well, that would mean he's the sixth, in, uh, sixth or seventh. So we, there's only one left. Uh, yeah, I think there's so, a lot of convergence on the idea that, that uh, we think that the Malachi prophecies have been proven well, correct for so long. All these basically are kind of converging on a central truth that uh, we are at the time of not the end of the world, but the end of the on the end of the age, and that God is asking us to repent right now because uh, our current resident in the White House, the abomination, is in prophecy. And if you get this book, Barack Obama Prophecy and the Destruction of the United States, your eyes will be open and you can go back to the scriptures and then you'll see other references to other prophecies. They're just amazing. No wonder it's pro- it's very popular. Uh, I got my book as I ordered it before. <laughs> you even had your copies from the printer. And uh, it's, it's getting dog-eared now. <laughs> we have to have you back on soon, Dr. Bob Teal, as the, uh, this uh, unfolds. And in the next six weeks, we're going to find out if we're going to have more of Obama in the second term, which I expect to happen. 